Uh, my name is Catherine Gedek Soltis, and I have the privilege of directing the Center for Peace and Justice Education here at Villanova University. I want to wel welcome you all, warmly welcome you all, to tonight's presentation of the 2015 Adela Dwyer St. Thomas of Villanova Peace Award. With this award, the Center uh, annually recognizes an outs outstanding contributions to the understanding of the meaning and conditions for justice and peace in human communities. Past recipients of the award include Archbishop Desmond Tutu, Sister Helen Prejean, Lema Bowie, and Wendell Berry. Tonight, we add to that awe-inspiring list a much-anticipated presentation to General Romeo Dallaire. I would like to express my sincere thanks to the members of the Peace Award Committee, Sue Toten, Jonathan Doe, Magan Keda, Paul Rozier, Barbara Quintiliano, Randy Weinstein, Will Stell and Tim Horner. I also want to thank uh, the many departments and centers that help support us in this effort tonight. The departments of military science, naval science, geography and the environment, history, political science, public administration, the ethics program, the Africana Studies program, and the Institute for Global Interdisciplinary, Interdisciplinary Studies. And finally, I want to acknowledge the hardworking faculty and staff of the Center for Peace and Justice Education, Sharon Disher, Carol Anthony, Jenny Joyce, Will Stell, Jim Wetzel, Jean McCarraher, Camille Burge, and Tim Horner. Dr. Horner has graciously agreed to introduce our award recipient tonight and share with you why he's so deserving of this recognition. I'd like to invite Dr. Horner up now. Thank you. Good evening. I have to admit, I'm a little more than excited to be standing here introducing General Romeo Dallaire. I know I shouldn't be, but I am slightly starstruck. In 2007, I went to Rwanda for the first time, and it changed my life. I shifted my focus from early Christian anti-Judaism of the second century to my current work studying the mechanics of how groups of people can come to believe that the best option for solving their problems is extreme violence or war or genocide. I've been teaching a course on genocide here at the university since 2009. Without getting into the weeds of my own relationship with Africa, specifically Rwanda, I can safely say that General Dallaire has been an inspiration and a role model of a person with a nearly fanatical commitment to confronting injustice and atrocity head on at the source. Even though this is an academic award, his life does not fit into an academic mold. I could list the things that General Dallaire has done in his life, and it would have you feeling as if you were in the presence of a fictional character. Many of us already know that General Dallaire was the commander of the UNAMIR forces, that was the United Nations assistant mission in Rwanda, during the months leading up to and through the genocide of the Tutsi and moderate Hutu in Rwanda in 1994. Some of you may associate him with the movie Hotel Rwanda, and he was played by Nick Nolte. That movie is crap as he says, <laughs> and it is crap. There is a much uh, more accurate depiction of General Dallaire can be found in his most famous book, Shake Hands with the Devil, which came out in 2004, and the movie, a Canadian movie, subsequent movie came out years later. There is no doubt that his experience in Rwanda forever changed the trajectory of his life. I know that the man sitting in front of me is made of flesh and blood, but it is difficult not to see him in heroic terms. But he is not a hero in the way we think about heroes. Heroes triumph over evil through superhuman strength or maybe even the intervention of divine forces. This is not what happened in Rwanda. Beyond the few instances of local or individual resistance, Rwanda was a tragedy in nearly every metric you could apply, especially when we look at the role of the international community, both in the years leading up to and through those 100 days of nightmare. That is precisely where General Dallaire is a little different and maybe even a little better than a hero. Heroes distract us from the loss and tragedy and pain that are left behind after conquest. General Dallaire has become the lens that has forced us in the West to see in Rwanda what we wanted so desperately to ignore. He chose to become the voice of our collective conscious. He has not allowed us to look or walk away from the results, albeit extreme, of European colonialism and international apathy. And he did this for one simple but profound reason. 
because there were human beings in Rwanda. Now, this might sound obvious or simplistic, but trust me, no one was acting like it. There were people who were trapped in the most horrific of circumstances, a full-blown genocide. And General Dallaire is not the type of person that can just walk away from something like this, even if the rest of the world does. One might imagine that a tour of duty through a genocide would be enough for one human life. But apparently, that is not true. <coughs> apparently, there is a greater form of suffering that haunts him. It is a suffering that took him out of politics. He was a Canadian senator for several years and has brought him right back into the fray with his work to eradicate the use of child soldiers. He is still haunted by the ghosts of Rwanda, but there is nothing he can do about what happened in 1994. But there is something he can do about the use of child soldiers today. And if General Dallaire is nothing, he is a man of action. You would have to talk to his wife, but I don't think General Dallaire fully understands the concept of the weekend. Maybe he understands it. Is that my guess is that he struggles to observe it. It would be fitting and appropriate to grant him this award for the work he did in Rwanda from September of 1993 through the length of the genocide. But he is not being honored for what he endured in Rwanda. He is being given the 2015 Villanova Peace Award for the work he is doing now to eradicate the use of child soldiers. This drive is what has brought him here to us today. It is his work that moved our committee to offer General Dallaire the 2015 Peace Award. His book, They Fight Like Soldiers, They Die Like Children, describes the process by which children are turned into soldiers. He also discusses the difficulty of working with international NGOs, humanitarian agencies, and military operations. These groups have struggled to find common language and common ground onto which to work. One of the more provocative ideas that General Dallaire has put forward is the idea that we need to get inside the mindset of those who see the use of child children as a cheap, renewable weapons system. This caused a stir for some humanitarian groups because it sounds so cold and callous. But what General Dallaire knows, maybe more than anyone, is that if we do not have the courage to get inside the mind of the perpetrator and face the ugly, expedient logic of this ideology and this practice, we will never be able to interrupt and eradicate this practice. We will always need people to care for the survivors. But General Dallaire is a man committed to denying oxygen to this toxic practice. In fact, the reason we had to postpone the granting of this award last year was because he was called to go to CAR and South Sudan and Uganda and Rwanda to consult with NATO and African Union forces on strategies to eradicate this tactic of warfare. This is not a new cause for him. In my mind, it is directly connected to his experiences in Rwanda. I'm not sure if he plans to tell the story of a, the Rwandan ch child he encountered in the middle of the road during the genocide, but this was the first time I became aware of this prominent and passionate theme in General Dallaire's concern, children and childhood. General Dallaire is acutely sensitive to the rules of war, which are designed to shield and protect the vulnerable from the horrors of war. And children are the most vulnerable members of our human family. So when both of these sensibilities are violated, as they are with the use of child soldiers, General Dallaire has found it impossible to sit still, and sit still he has not. So we are awarding General Dallaire the Peace Award, not only for what he has done, for what, but for what he is doing now. He is the embodiment of a person who has dedicated their life to moving humanity forward into a more peaceful and just world. We are delighted and honored to give him this award today. And so I would like to re-invite Dr. Gedek Solsis to the stage and also welcome and invite Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire to re receive the 2015 Villanova Peace Award.
General Dallaire, you have inspired us to be steadfast in the face of injustice, unspeakable injustice, especially on behalf of the most vulnerable and marginalized. I want to thank you so much for reminding us of the unassailable possibility of peace and transformation. On behalf of Villanova University, I'd like to, it's my honor to present to you tonight the 2015 Adela Dwyer St. Thomas of Villanova Peace Award. Cutting into my time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you ever so much for inviting me here this evening uh, to speak to you and to receive this award. Uh, of course, uh, retired generals who have been apprenticed politicians don't need awards to want to go and speak in front of people. Uh, more often than not, is trying to keep them off the podium is the problem. Uh, but uh, this evening, uh, as today, uh, with the students, um, I've had wonderful exchanges, uh, and I hope uh, this evening, with a few words uh, to start, we'll be able to uh, engage also in a few questions and answers. Uh, the most complex difficulty uh, for a person like myself uh, in such a circumstance is try to be brief. And so brevity is not our strength um, when we have an opportunity to speak, but I will do my best to discipline uh, and touch on a few of the points that uh, our good professor uh, spoke of as the introduction. In fact, uh, I think we could do with just that introduction, and that'd be enough for this evening. I uh, thought it quite complete and quite quite well done, and I want a copy, please. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, this evening I want to touch on something uh, that um, is engaging us um, internationally uh, to the extent where it is present even in our midst. That is to say, it's made its way across the pond uh, and it's recruiting even uh, in our own uh, ranks, in our youth uh, of our mutual countries, uh, Canada and the United States, as we've seen such recruitment also in a number of European countries. And what I speak of is the extreme uh, violence uh, coming from radicalization uh, and that uh, that radicalization that leads to extreme violence uh, has in fact uh, enticed a number of young people, most under 25, many barely 18, uh, to actually risk all, uh, go to foreign lands under the guise of promises of greater things uh, only to find ultimately being used as sex slaves, as uh, cannon fodder, uh, and in fact, ultimately, few actually survive the conflicts. Best known of those groups is ISIS right now, uh, that our forces, our special forces, both your country and mine, are engaged in uh, fighting in northern Iraq, particularly in the Kurdish areas, uh, and uh, also uh, in the specific Kurdish area on the Syrian side of the border, and trying to attenuate the impact of this extreme use of children, of youths, uh, to be the primary weapon of war uh, in these conflicts. And this is a major shift in uh, what has been the nature of conflict uh, in the past. It is true uh, that uh, young people have been used in the past in conflicts. We can easily look at some of the British background of drummer boys and regiments 
and bugle boys and others of uh, young midshipmen or whatever the term was, uh, cadets on board ships at 13 and 14. Um, and uh, that presence, however, uh, was a presence of a very minority entity. It was a, a bit of a side element to the actual combatants, the primary combatants uh, of the conflict. Uh, we also are very much aware, and 11th of November is around the corner, in fact, uh, in two days, uh, of how many under the age of 18, even though the rules and the law uh, that we have established, your country and mine, uh, that we would not recruit under 18, and nor would we send under 18 to conflict zones. We actually applied that in World War I, yet if you go to France and uh, Belgium, you'll see a number of white crosses there, uh, of young men uh, of the time, mostly men, uh, who uh, were 16, 17, uh, and had uh, run the gauntlet and were able to sneak in uh, to seek uh, an opportunity uh, to prove themselves, to move away from the family protection, uh, and really, yeah, to serve. Uh, for a cause with their colleagues, uh, with their buddies in regiments, uh, and ultimately pay the price. So again, these were the exceptions, the, the few uh, relative in numbers. We go to World War II, and we see uh, a, particularly from the German Nazi side, the building of the Hitler Youth. Uh, it was a movement, it was a, a very politically focused movement of selecting young people and nurturing them to be the pride and the, the, the emblem of, of, a, of a race uh, that was to forge the future of that country. Uh, and in fact, as the war uh, went on, they shifted them from being the pride and the, so the, the, the emancipation of a great nation to ultimately turned into them too, a weapon of war of despair meaning that in the ebbing part of the war, uh, they used uh, young people, as that's what was left. Uh, the adult males being nearly completely expired, uh, they used these young people as a last effort to hold off uh, the uh, end of the war of, uh, on their side. Again, not the primary system, again, a, a sort of a add-on, a last-ditch effort. And uh, you have seen through uh, the French, and you Americans in particular, the Australians who fought with you and so on, then in, in Vietnam and in Indochina, as the French would say, uh, youth were used on a number of occasions, but again, uh, not as primary systems, uh, but were presence. Uh, however, that shifted, shifted significantly with the end of the Cold War. When we moved away from using professional armies and see ourselves facing uh, different threats. Uh, and threats uh, that are not uh, classic big armies facing big armies, but in fact uh, threats of professional armies, yes, on one side, but many non-state actors uh, who are in the fight for a variety of reasons and are using as their primary weapon system. Youths. Youths as young as eight, nine, forty percent of them being girls, uh, to achieve their aim and to sustain the fight uh, for years to come. Actually indoctrinating them and putting them into the fray when they achieve 13 years old. Others using them right off the bat as we've seen in Africa on a number of occasions, and these children uh, have fought for seven, eight, nine years, uh, and have lost every contact with normal society, have, have no idea what love is, have no idea what a family is, uh, don't even understand what the village that they've been attacking, why it's structured that way, so indoctrinated, so involved, so engaged, and also uh, so under fear and duress and abuse. Uh, that they've lost all sense of what a society could be, and, and becoming adults. And there's a really significant uh, uh, trial going on right now in the International Criminal Court, uh, of which I will be there next week, 
uh, in which uh, a gentleman joined under duress, stolen out of his village uh, at the age of nine, uh, the Lord's Resistance Army with Joseph Kony in Uganda, and who terrorized that whole region. Uh, and then at the age of 18 was still part of the, the, that force. Uh, and finally was captured, uh, debate whether he gave up or not, but it was captured at the age of 25. And so the interesting scenario is, is that while he's a child soldier and under the convention of the pr child protection uh, and the optional protocol on child rights that says no one under 18 is to be uh, treated in a punitive process of justice, but in fact uh, is to be rehabilitated, reintegrated into society. And so here we have somebody who's lived essentially his life, conscious life, uh, as a fighter in the bush, known only that to survive, then turns 18, uh, and then we are going to prosecute him. We're prosecuting him because from the ages of 18 to 25, he was still part of that force. Yet all that person has known is fighting, is surviving. And so the question is, is that up until the age of 18 would not be punitive, but from 18 to 25 is punitive. Is that, in fact, justice? For that individual had no other reference in his life except doing exactly what his superiors and what he'd been indoctrinated and drugged up and so on to do. And all he knew was to fight, to kill, to destroy. And so, yes, the young adult brain at 18-ish uh, has an ability to discern. Uh, but if that is the only reference you have, how much in mitigation can we present to defend that individual? To what extent do we uh, use uh, the whole development, the 10 years previous, as mitigation to what happened post-18? And so I'm going as a, a witness of the defense uh, to argue that there is a mitigating premise there. Not a complete uh, wash away, but a mitigation. And the reason I bring this example up this evening uh, at this point, is to show the complexity and the ambiguities in which we find ourselves in this era of facing these threats and of seeing conflicts sustained by these unusual threats and our inability to, one, prevent them from happening, which is the ultimate aim, but also once we are into the fray, how do we solve it? And how do we ultimately bring justice? How do we bring an ability of reconciliation. And in that reconciliation, we see fairness and the ability of people to live as equals in respect and not fear each other. And this is what we've stumbled into. We didn't plan it. We didn't train for it. I'm a graduate of the US Marine Corps Staff College and the good colonel is here this evening. My deputy commander was a Ghanaian general who was also a graduate of Marine Corps Staff College the year before me. We never planned or thought that we would find ourselves in an era of imploding nations and failing states and civil wars and mass atrocities and even genocide. It never even occurred that that could be a possibility. We were focused on the European front, big armies facing big armies, two and a half million on our side, in uniforms and all structured, four and a half million on the other side, big mobilization base, and a line in the sand or a wall. You gotta watch how we use the term wall these days. Anyways, and this, and this Cold War reference point. And it was simple. We just trained and served in Germany and focused. I was in Northern Norway often or in Central Europe. Uh, and all we needed was one of those guys to start crossing that line and bingo, it was the classic use of force of attrition warfare and the last one left standing would win. It was nearly simplistic. 
armies, facing armies, and fighting uh, to see an ultimate end and one winning. And then subsequently, you hope a process politically driven, we hope of reconciliation and rebuilding and hoping for peace in the future. That all went out the window. But there was a last hurrah to that, uh, that forced many, both in uniform and even diplomats, uh, to think that, well, uh, the Cold War and the peace dividend and what George Bush Sr. said, a new world order, uh, that would happen with the end of the Cold War, uh, would still call for uh, massive forces facing massive forces in the classic sense. And that last hurrah was the first Gulf War. And so you get this great humongous general uh, who opened the flap of his tent one morning and looked at the sun and studied the entrails of a pigeon and said, go. And 700,000 troops faced 400,000 troops and went at it in a very classic way in the first Gulf War. Uh, and was the attrition was being turned into a turkey shoot was ended, but essentially it was a proof that, hey, we needed still big armies. However, what happened was is that the war didn't end with those two armies facing it. One army destroyed. The shooting continued. The killing continued. The conflict continued. Took a turn left and right. Casualties continued to grow. Integrating the belligerents into the societies, using the societies and the communities as, as cover, as front, as recruitment bases, and changing the nature of the battle in these imploding nations, and in fact, in that area, which spread in regions where frictions of differences of ethnicity and tribalism and religion and simply power sharing gave opportunities for either governments rogue as they may be, or non-state actors uh, to actually go into conflict and to destroy each other with varying, of course, levels of effectiveness and, of course, all in all cases, massive abuses of human rights uh, and massive abuses uh, of the human life, which even led to genocide. This scenario that I describe uh, is in a scenario that, to my chagrin, has been the scenario over the last 25 years. And in so doing, you sort of wonder whether we're sorting this thing out or not. Uh, why do we always seem to be caught off guard? Why is there always a new initiative as the ISIS appears, as the Boko Haram appears, as the Al Shabaab appears? Uh, as uh, a stable country like Kenya, not this last election, but the previous one, seemingly stable, finds itself in an election where one tribe dominates the results of the election, which creates a reaction from the opposition that within two weeks, they had four genocide radio stations out there telling people how to slaughter the people of other tribes. From a country that we invested massively and in fact were a country we saw uh, that democracy and self-government, uh, where we saw rule of law being established, education levels at a high degree, still reverted to the most basic premises of, of tribalism, of ethnicity, to achieve their aim, to be the solution to their friction and ultimately to lead them to actually, without chagrin, slaughter and destroy each other. And we barely, we barely made our way through that one uh, because of an intervention at the time by Kofi Annan, who was the uh, past Secretary General of the UN, based on a concept that finally, finally came to the fore. We finally started to at least during this period invent a few new things of how to handle these conflicts. 
1999, there was what is called the Brahimi Report. It was quite a significant gentleman who brought in significant reforms to peacekeeping. And essentially said that peacekeeping is no more a blue beret, short pants, baseball bat, uh, and no red card or penalty box. That we're there to observe. That we're there, the good guys, the referee, that if these two groups would sign an agreement, had some frictions, we'd dare there to help them out. That concept worked perfectly well during the Cold War. It worked well when one nation and another nation were at friction with each other, or regional bodies. But it fell totally short when, in fact, we found ourselves in imploding nations where Rwandans were slaughtering Rwandans. How do you find the peace agreement? How do you define the good guy and the bad guy? They're not wearing a white hat or a black hat. How do you know that they've all signed with the true willingness to see peace or that some signed under duress? And that ultimately some would create capabilities to undermine the peace process. How do you, how do you find these people? How do you discern that? And how do you react to it? And so slow off the mark. The UN tried to figure out that maybe we've got to go to what is called Chapter 7, which is the potential use of force in order to protect human beings. It was a slow process. I was already six weeks into the genocide. Well over 400,000 had been slaughtered. I had over 30,000 under my protection. And in New York, Security Council, led by the Permanent Five, of which your country is a major leader, were debating whether or not I was allowed to protect people, whether I had the mandate to use my forces to protect Rwandans against other Rwandans. And when I'm up to my ears in bodies and people trying to seek protection, yet in concept-wise, in thinking, in mandate, they t it hadn't been thought through yet. And so by 1999, Brahimi sort of brought a certain focus to that in trying to make us understand that peacekeeping maybe doesn't exist anymore. Maybe we're into peace support operations. That maybe we must be prepared to use force to protect civilians. And that in so doing, it has to be judiciously used because if not, then you simply become another belligerent. You start opening fire on one side or the other, you simply become a third belligerent and you become free target. And so how to judiciously do that? And how to deploy the forces uh, to be able to meet that challenge? Size of force to be effective uh, in these complex missions. How do you deploy a force in a country the size of the Congo. Think of Texas and multiply it by 10, by 20. And we put 26,000 troops in there. 26,000 troops is not, what we, not enough to deploy in Philadelphia if there was any kind of a bit of an insurrection. We need hundreds of thousands. And so we find ourselves Yes, realizing the complexity, but not putting the resources, the will to intervene. Well, that's added something else to it. There was a, the will to actually engage and to provide resources for peace, but then to actually intervene. Possibly use of force. Where is the will to intervene? Particularly after a second major reform was introduced. And this one has caught people significantly by surprise. I spoke uh, and, uh, in Munster uh, in the hall where the Westphalia Treaty was signed. Every year they have a speaker come to speak on the concept of sovereignty, which Westphalia created, and its nation state concept, which we are. Over three centuries ago was created refined with years and so on. And what I argued there that is that in 2005 
when the General Assembly of the UN accepted the concept of responsibility to protect. It shifted sovereignty from being sovereignty of the state to sovereignty of the individual. And that we had, the rest of the world, a responsibility to protect the sovereignty, the human rights of individuals that would be massively abused in those human rights by either the government or where the government could not prevent it from happening. And so we have this doctrine that the UN agreed to in 2005, that we are to intervene. We are to put boots on the ground to protect civilians, not to take sides as we screwed up in Libya, as we are even afraid of touching with currently in Syria, but to actually put boots on the ground to protect civilians. And so with that concept of protecting civilians, one would say we can now proactively engage and in fact prevent some of these conflicts from happening, right? We have that ability to intervene and so we've got the mandate from the world to do so when massive abuses of human rights happen, so we can go in. And in line with that was created an advisory board to the Secretary General, which I was a member, and Desmond Tutu was a member, and it was called the Genocide Prevention Advisory Board. And our role that we had articulated was to go into countries where we saw frictions happening and try to influence them to not let the situation degenerate to ultimately become a mass atrocities conflict, mass atrocities and genocide. But it had an inherent problem. And the inherent problem of intervention was the will to intervene. Do we actually want to intervene? I mean, do these human beings actually count enough for us to want to intervene? Or for us to take the risks? And I say us, our political elite, of wanting to take the political capital to intervene, and intervene early enough, and also have the courage to sustain casualties in a humanitarian intervention. For this country paid a significant price in Mogadishu, only four months before the genocide in Rwanda. In October of 93, when those 19 rangers, of which a few of the bodies were dragged through the streets of Mogadishu, the President of the United States changed overnight the fundamental policy of humanitarian intervention and protection of civilians and wanting to advance peace and prospects of peace in countries that may be in conflict to one of, in fact, non-intervention of actually producing a presidential directive 25 that came out in March of 94, one month before the Rwandan genocide. It said the United States would not engage in any conflict unless it was in its self-interest. So we've got this problem here of a background in the 90s as we try to figure out what these conflicts are about where the human beings are not an overriding factor. And in fact, we're told by countries that resources, oh, that's different. Self-interest, that's different. That we can engage in. But human beings, is that worthy of us to spill blood? Do we spill blood in order to protect people who are at each other's throat because in their process of getting rid of the colonial past, of building their capacity in their country, of modernizing, of bringing rule of law, democracy, of trying to adapt it to their cultural frameworks, that they actually have frictions that do lead to conflict, that lead to war, that in that process, well, no, we, we won't intervene. We're not gonna spill blood. Hey. This country was built on a revolution. 
not only was it built on a revolution, and you paid in blood an extraordinary price of becoming a great republic, but then you decided about 80 odd years later on to beat the living daylights out of each other again in order to establish a framework of what you believe to be right. And that civil war that you had, the price that was paid in blood here to establish the framework of what this nation is, is it possible that that reference does not count in a world that we now can speak to the whole of humanity, where we can see the whole global picture of humanity, where we believe now in human rights, where we've achieved a, ma a level of maturity that is unequaled in our time, that we cannot see that those human beings may require an intervention to help. Yes, in a conflict to attenuate it, reduce the impact on the innocent civilian population, but more importantly, and what certainly should be the objective, is actually intervening to prevent the conflict from starting in the first place. Now imagine that. How can we intervene in a country before the conflict starts? How can we intervene in a prevention mode? How much political risk are we willing to take to do something like that? And I would argue that there's a higher risk by the political elite of doing that than there is of intervening once the show has started. Because if you go in early, and if the thing goes well, the first questions will be asked is why were we there in the first place? Nothing happened. We wasted all this time, you know, we could, have, could have done something else with it. The other angle is what happens if the situation goes bad, goes bad. Are you then blamed for having aided and abetted one side or the other, and in so doing, exacerbated the situation? And I would argue, ladies and gentlemen, that our unwillingness to go in early, our unwillingness to put boots on the ground, to be interventionists, not as great powers trying to subsume anybody else, but as interventionists in the aim of establishing protection of civilians, our unwillingness to do that has in fact exacerbated a number of conflicts that are still ongoing and will continue to go because we're not willing to take that risk, that we are led by politicians. Without talking about that, I'm not in uniform anymore. I'm not even a politician anymore. There is no way that a democracy can function without politicians. I think it is a great calling in a democracy to be a politician. Because if you don't have politicians, you've got anarchy or you've got dictators. You need politicians. But what the world needs the world without borders because of the revolution communications. This, this global sphere, that's very precious little bluish ball that the astronauts show us all the time. That looks so vulnerable all the time. Don't see any borders on that. What that little blue ball needs, what that seven billion people need, something higher than politics. It needs statesmanship. It needs statesmanship, an ability of other human beings to rise to such a level that they have intellectual flexibility of thought and free thinking, have the courage to take risks, have the humility to recognize that there are other solutions to the problem, and have the charisma to bring other human beings along, and have the fundamental courage to sustain the mission, even though it may take years, and keep those who are with them also engaged for that period of time to protect other human beings. That is the part that does not exist today. 
where is not a statesman among any of them in the world. And that dearth of statesmanship in this time of enormous complexity and ambiguity is why we are continuously trying to catch up with the bad guys, why we are continuously seeing conflicts exploding, why we are seeing millions being displaced and refugeed, and why we see extremism being pushed to the extent of not only destroying societies completely and nation states as we're seeing with ISIS, but also coming to nations and great nations who want to move the R6 part of the way and making them the targets as you well enough remember with 9-11. And to sustain that effort by even coming to recruit our own to help their conflict. So ladies and gentlemen, we're not on a winning side here yet. Because we really still haven't grasped the full nature of the complexity. And we haven't found those solutions to get ahead of the game. We've got a lot of capacity, but it hasn't found a way to work together. All these different disciplines, the humanitarian world, the development world, the nation building world, the security world, police and military, the judicial world, the whole rule of law construct, they just don't seem to be able to mesh it together to come up with solutions that could, in fact, be innovative to the extent that we could offer, maybe, our good politicians who are all very near-term, very tactical, very local, actually give them some solutions that they can chew on and get a bit of a warm, fuzzy feeling that maybe with these tools, they might be able to do something. And so the future of conflict prevention, the future of treating all humans equally, the future of belief of human rights and applica uh, application of human rights is not in the hands of the politicians. It's right here. We have got to invent the solutions that we can offer up to those political elites to guide them in using the right tools <coughs> at the right time to ultimately demonstrate the competency and courage to be able to intervene early. And I would end by the following. The last thing this great nation should be is the first one in. You should not ever be the first one in. You are not the world police. You are the world power. Your strength is not in the use of your power. It is in the threat of the use of your power. And so in order to get into the forefront, you need somebody to be your sort of reconnaissance team, your advanced team, to be able to come in with a different set of parameters, with no background, no imperial background, or artificially created or perceived background of subsuming anybody else. You have got to find a way to engage the middle powers of this world, who have been riding your coattails and are prepared to go in when you're going in, and are fast to pull out when it doesn't go their way, and leave you standing there. There are a series, there's about 20 middle powers in the world, of which my country is one of the leading ones. It's part of the 11 most powerful nations in the world, has been sitting on the fence, and it's been sitting on the fence where it could bring in innovative thinking, could go in with a lot less baggage, could in fact, engage and bring innovative ideas and, in fact, prevent, by the nature of the beast it is, from scenarios to get worse. And should things do get out of hand, then yeah, come in sometimes with the Powell Doctrine, with overwhelming force, and, and sort the thing out. But before doing that, before coming in and getting a bloody nose and then pulling out, force those countries to start paying the price of advancing humanity, of preventing conflicts, 
and stopping the massive abuses of human rights. Force them to engage. That, to me, is a sign of a great power. Not hauling in a bunch to work with you, but kicking a bunch in the ass to get out there, ahead of you. As you hold the overwatch, as we would use the term in the military. And stand by as we need your political strength. And certain, yes, critical assets I'll not negate. But don't, don't commit first. The greatest asset that can come from this great power is you're able to convince other middle powers, sorry, the middle powers, and let the middle powers work with the developing countries to actually engage early. Encourage them, help them, move them, coerce them, threaten them to get in there early. Because that's the only way we will be able to start really protecting the civilians and ultimately achieve the aims of at least reducing the scale of casualties that go on in this country. I'm uh, sorry, in this, in this planet. I'd like to end with a little story about you guys and us. A little bit of, I hope, humor, because it seems like a pretty heavy subject that we've been chewing on here. When I, um, when I go to American military installations, institute, war colleges and so on, when I was in uniform and would come down to speak on conflict and peacekeeping and stuff like that, I used to like to imitate one of your great generals. General Patton. Really, I like to imitate George C. Scott, who played Patton in the movie. <laughs> if you remember in the movie, and if you haven't, it's worthwhile to watch. He comes on stage at the start, and he's got this humongous American flag. They're just massive. He comes up, and he's got all his bells and whistles on and so on. And he says, gentlemen, because that was the framework of military forces principally in the time, he said, gentlemen, the aim is to make the other poor bastard die for his country. Attrition warfare, classic warfare. For centuries, we matured it and, and brought it to a peak to which we finally won the war with President Reagan of, of actually having such a capability that we didn't even have to fire a shot and win the war. I mean, that's really bringing it to a sophisticated level. So when I go to these institutions, there's always lots of students, they're huge and so on. I put a big Canadian flag on behind me. And I walk to the center of the stage and I look at the student body there and I say, I come from a country that beat you guys twice. And you really hear the gears turning. What is this guy talking about? And I said, yes. I said, 1775. General Montgomery coming up, Champlain, and you should remember to attack Canada during your expansionism. And we beat him at the gates of Quebec City on New Year's Eve in a snowstorm and fought back uh, the American invasion of Canada the first time. Then the second time, of course, is the War of 1812, which we recently commemorated. And I. Always I'm prepared for the smart aleck who says, wait a minute, you guys didn't win the war of 1812, we won the war, right? You guys won, we didn't win. And I said, no, no, no. I said, we won the war. I said, you guys came north and found this fortress called York, which is Toronto, by the big lake of Ontario. And you burned the place down. I'm from Montreal, that doesn't bother me much. <laughs> I said, what did we do? We came south. We found this town built on a swamp. It had malaria. It had mosquitoes all over the place. It was hot. It was humid. It was a horrible place to be. We did you a favor. We burned the damn place down. What do you do? You rebuild it. Washington. <laughs> I'm not sure who's the smartest of the two. And so I preferred to take them. Maybe it did end up in a draw. And ladies and gentlemen, that's how friends ultimately think of their past. It's a draw. We 
put the hatchet aside and we figure out ways how to reinforce each other. And so no, we will not build a wall since this election yesterday. We will, I am sure, work diligently of keeping North America safe and not have to build Fortress North America with the threats that are out there that are always to be a great concern that we won't have to build a fortress North America, that we will go ultimately to where the rage in the world is and try to attenuate it there. And with new ideas and commitment, I believe that we may even prevent that rage from actually getting to a boiling point of wanting to actually use force against other human beings. Thank you very much. Would you please tell us about your experience trying to protect the 30,000 and how the UN should have intervened at that time and why it didn't and how you tried to coax them to but failed, please? Yeah. Um, we ended up with the 30,000 because a number were caught behind the lines of the other, the other ethnic group. And uh, there were five major sites that uh, we had established uh, as protection sites. And under the UN flag, we were able to hold true to that. And even the extremists uh, uh, at times would try to come in to do small operations, but essentially uh, protected it. My fear, however, was always that uh, I couldn't get food or water to my sites. And so uh, I was losing soldiers, uh, casualties, uh, not as much to bullets as to uh, dying of thirst and, and hunger. Because they couldn't eat while they were protecting people inside who were dying of thirst and hunger. And so there was a real problematic that was escalating. And so the bad guys didn't have to attack the sites, they just had to smother us as they, as they were doing until we finally got uh, material to help us. The 32,000, uh, a number of them we were able to move between the lines uh, under great duress and, and took casualties doing that uh, by the extremists. And the militia, particularly in Tanamwe, was a youth militia. China sent just about, we've estimated 160,000 brand new machetes three months before the genocide. We've never found who ordered them. We couldn't, couldn't find who ordered them. But they were there. And that's how they slaughtered. And it was youths, ages here and younger, who were the youth movement of a political party that was turned into a militia, and they're the ones who, who, who slaughtered all the others. Um, the second thing is, is that I, I think it's maybe a little too easy to say that the UN failed in Rwanda. I think that first, we, that, let's look at the, a bit more of the entrails of this thing. I would argue that uh, I failed in my mission in making mistakes uh, of a mission that wasn't equipped and nor had enough personnel or to do the job. I think the UN failed in how the mandate was written and so on and its pro prosecution of it within the limits it had. I think the Secretary General failed massively by keeping the Security Council out of the loop uh, as he was a very controlling person and nothing could happen unless he was there and he was off and away. And so the Security Council was a bit left out hanging, and the Security Council members 
Well, uh, you, I explained what Madeleine Albright said, essentially, the morning the genocide started. She said, very simply, the United States is not going to intervene and will help nobody who wants to. And the rest of them, of course, a few attempted, New Zealand and Czechoslovakia, but, or Slovakia, but very, very feeble attempts. So the Security Council was. But where, where the blame, I would argue, if I may really lie, was in every sovereign state in the world that refused, even though 68 countries had promised before the genocide, before the war started, that if called upon, they would make forces available. They had signed a informal agreement that all those countries, out of the 193, there is at least 68, if not a few more, that could have provided me with assets, that could have provided the Security Council with the mandate to change my mandate to a chapter seven, get me the resources on the ground and stop the genocide. And every one of them deliberately refused. That's where the failure is. For the UN is us. If we don't want to give it the tools, it can only be and ends up being the escape goat that often we like to use. And so it is interesting that Kofi Annan, who was the head of peacekeeping at the time, uh, well, then uh, got elected as Secretary General. And the United States was a big pusher for that because it was recognized that there was reforms needed. And there was a group uh, with the Americans, including us, that wanted these reforms. So by 2003, 2004, close to 100 major reforms were produced. Everything from how to recruit, to train, processes, bringing in strategic command and control for the Security Council, strategic planning, for using the military committee, and, and a whole bunch of stuff. Three months before the 2005 General Assembly that was going to vote on a process of implementing and working at implementing those, uh, those, agreement, those uh, reforms, one of the permanent five vetoed it. And the guy has a white mustache. His name is Bolton. The United States, who had asked to bring about these reforms, saw the scale of the reforms and articulated what the other guys were worried about, the four others. And that is that if those reforms had been implemented over maybe 20 years, it would give the UN such a capacity that it would be able to be a major player in the flow of the international community's interactions. And the big guys didn't want another player to fiddle. They wanted somebody to help them when they needed, somebody to be an escape goat when they needed it, but not to be one of the major players. And that's why those nearly 100 reforms are still sitting there, and only the French have recently come forward and are prepared, prepared to let their veto go in the case of a genocide or mass atrocities that are happening, they would forego their veto power. And they're trying to influence the other players to do that. That's my short answer on that one. Thank you. A very good question. Yes, yes, ma'am. And my students and I represent refugees, and we've represented people from Rwanda and child soldiers. Right now, my entire docket is um, unaccompanied minors and women and children from Central America who are fleeing gang-based violence. So it's not necessarily the government, but it's a group the government can control. And even in the case of some situations like the truce in El Salvador, yeah. there's some indications that the government <laughs> was negotiating pretty heavily with the, and, and giving a lot of favors to the gangs in order to do that truce. So I'm wondering when you talk about this middle power, I think that was the term you used, right? How, is there a way for us to think about figure, <laughs> a solution to Central America 
the issues in El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala so that children aren't forcibly recruited into the gangs and we can figure out a way to rehabilitate that part of the world given that it's so close to North America and, um, you know, and the and the, the kind of the risks and the costs of having people flee their home country are so significant. I was, um, I think about six years ago or so, I was in Rio. And uh, I was in Rio uh, called by an NGO called Viva Rio. And they're in the favelas, in the slums, uh, and trying to help the children who are in the heart of the drug wars. Uh, all the drugs moving through the favelas are by, done by kids and youths, youth gangs. Uh, in Rio, they kill annually about 2,000 kids in that town alone. Police, corrupt police, and so on, amongst themselves. And so what they were trying to uh, discuss with me, and I went into the favelas and saw the fighting and, and so on, was that children caught up in the drug wars and in these drug gang-related uh, scenarios are just the same as child soldiers. And as such, should then be worthy of the attention that child soldiers are getting uh, and actually start bringing in capacity to, to go in and solve that problem. Uh, and although we raised it, 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 it never got the traction. And the excuse has been, well, we haven't solved the child soldier one yet. And, and even with all the work that we're doing and, and a number of us are doing, we got 40, 50 years of work ahead of us you know, to, to really cut, to change the ethos in, in countries regarding children in, in armed conflict. Uh, and so uh, there is a desire to move the, the children uh, who are caught up in these gangs and drug wars be it in Central America particularly, but South America, and, and raise them to the level of attention that we have now. Uh, and next week I'm at the International Criminal Court. I'm doing testifying on one side. The other thing is we wrote the standing operating procedure for the prosecution of, uh, of perpetrators of recruitment of child soldiers. The, the chief prosecutor didn't have a, uh, a process by which her prosecutors knew how to handle it, and so we, we brought material so they can guide them in how they prosecute these, these, these characters. And, and it's going to be published next week. And so uh, we, we finally have uh, an international convention, an international law uh, by the International Criminal Court that says uh, recruitment and use of child soldiers is a crime against humanity. We're nowhere near that in regards to children in, in the favelas. Uh, nor are we in, in protecting unaccompanied minors in our own countries where too often they're also being abused. One thing we are doing, however, is, is that uh, uh, we're working with major police forces, my, my group out of Halifax, Montreal, Toronto, and Edmonton, uh, on how to get into the uh, communities, diaspora communities in our country, get into the diaspora gangs, helping the police do that and, and still keep their, their, their position of respect and not abuse their, their, their powers, and how to turn the gangs to uh, turn the lone wolves or make us aware of the lone wolves who might be recruited. And we've got a three-year program that we're halfway through right now uh, in doing that. And I think uh, changing the focus, even though they're, they're criminal, but in, in a number of gangs are criminal. Other gangs are purely self-protection. A lot of the Aboriginal gangs out west are self-protection gangs, uh, uh, and turning them into actually instruments of uh, going after a whole different ambition in life, you know, peace, uh, preventing other kids from being sucked in to do other things. So th there's a, a little stuff going on, but nowhere, nowhere near enough. Thank you for raising that. Thank you again. Um, sorry, I had to write down my question. I was probably going to forget it. Um, so this is coming from a more theoretical perspective of like your 
like peacekeeping theory and all that kind of stuff. But like, we're, will we're, to, we're in academia. You're permitted. <laughs> so like for will to intervene versus R2P, kind of, is that more? Is the earlier doctrine kind of like a supplement and replacement to R2P and kind of base to follow up with that question, kind of like understanding how interna international law is enforced and binding, but making it difficult to enforce because of the consequences being sort of based on convention and all that kind of stuff. Um, how would you get states seeing intervention as less, you know, supererogatory, kind of not beyond the call of the call of duty, but something that is more worth, I don't know, use, worth, use the phrase worth their time, but kind of making it important to get involved. Yeah, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. The, the subtitle of my first book is the, um, the Failure of Humanity in Rwanda. And, and the Rwandans slaughtering each other was a failure of humanity. But it was the failure of the rest of humanity to want to intervene in, in that. Uh, I think that um, subsequent to that, and when I was called by the Secretary General to be part of the Genocide Prevention Group, um, I went to the Montreal Institute of Genocide Studies at Concordia University. And with a team there, uh, we spent two years uh, taking R2P and saying, how do we operationalize this thing? I mean, how do we make people want to use it? Uh, and we came up with the will to intervene. And so there's a, we published it. Uh, and part of that was to prepare nations to be able to intervene instead of all of a sudden a crisis saying, oh geez, what do we do now? And the interventions that we argue uh, are not solely military. In fact, rare are now the solutions solely military. They're multidisciplinary, they're a whole of government. There is a whole series of different players that got to be working together in these employee nations, these failing states, and how to bring solutions to the, to the problem, of which the security side is not insignificant, but it is not the overriding one is how it can function with all the others. And so the will to intervene argued two things. One, it's in our self-interest to go in every one of those conflicts because they're influencing us. Pandemics, uh, terrorism, uh, where, we, where resources are, uh, influence of diasporas and so on. So there's a, there's a reason to go in. And secondly, is we had to create a capacity of having the whole of government at least acknowledge that there is the potential of mass atrocities and how would we respond to that? How do, how do we handle that? And so, to my surprise, no, no, it's right, to my chagrin, is the government that was in power at the time in Canada didn't want to do anything to do with it. Uh, yet Samantha Power, who was working for uh, Ms. Rice, the National Security Advisor at the time, uh, took our, our work in regards to humanitarian intervention and took three of the recommendations. And one of the principal ones was to create a, a board, a group uh, of all possible departments that could be called upon to intervene. And that they every month meet and that they have a body that is a focal point for considering how to intervene. What would be the factors? Where are the places that are possibilities? And what contingency sort of planning can you do in preparation? So we've been trying to get countries around the world to create these focal points in their own governments. Because government departments often don't like working together and so on, because of their budgets and so on. But to actually create that capacity uh, and that these different focal points actually then start talking to each other from the different countries. So as an, a different body, focus purely on uh, the prevention of mass atrocities and actually the application of R2P. Now, R2P uh, and the will to intervene, which is the, the instrument to apply it, um, has had a bit of an amendment uh, because uh, a number of countries have really objected to how Libya was handled. And I don't blame them because Libya went beyond the mandate. Uh, and it went beyond the mandate because NATO went beyond the mandate and the Security Council did not control NATO. In fact, NATO didn't even tell the Security Council where they were at. And the commander of that was a Canadian and he told me that he was operating with, with NATO purely. 
and, and so there's no formal structure between NATO and, and the Security Council to guide what was happening on the ground. And so it went into a regime change. And so the Russians and Chinese have been using that as an excuse not to apply R2P because look, R2P means we can go in wherever we want and change the regime. And that was not the plan. The plan was to establish a line in the sand with, yes, when Gaddafi said, I'm going to crush these cockroaches of actually putting boots on the ground with local, the African Union, with the Arab states, with countries like Canada and so on, the middle powers to reinforce the African Union, I would say, by Chapter 8. Chapter 8 is reinforcing regional bodies, sub-regional bodies. We could have done that and not equip the rebels or the, the population, not bring in all kinds of mercenaries, not bring in all kinds of weaponry that destabilize the whole damn region, but just set that line up and tell Gaddafi, you cross that line, you're taking us on. And then work out a deal, like we did to Charles Taylor in Liberia. You know? And so he ends up in Nigeria for 20 years, and then finally we bring him for the International Criminal Court, and now he's in a very comfortable jail. Well, so what? That's a reasonable price. And what we end up with, we end up with a catastrophic failure of the whole damn thing. And with R2P then being under enormous duress, the Brazilians trying to change it, uh, and that created an enormous amount of friction. Uh, but uh, now we are using the term protection of civilians or civilian populations versus R2P to, to try to attenuate the concerns of the Russians and the Chinese. Uh, and so it, 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 it can be still applied. Uh, it, it can be applied, but it's got to be applied by smaller players who are willing to push it uh, and to be prepared to, to do the intervention, but also to be prepared uh, to bring in some innovative solutions early, not late, early. And I guess that's my final point, is, is that the political elites because they're so political, because they're so tactical, they're, they're so near term, uh, they're so local, and we force them to be like that, because just look at the newspapers, that's all they, we hold them accountable for that, far more than anything else, uh, because they simply can't grasp uh, the fact of engaging in things of that nature which can be long term, and which will not necessarily provide a result very rapidly. And so prevention is not good for votes. It's just well, that terrible. Thank you. Thank you. I have one very small question. I would be remiss not to ask this. Given your experience um, working in areas where there's conflict and potential uh, danger, this country's been visiting territory recently that is pretty new for a lot of us in this generation. Do you have any thoughts, briefly or any otherwise, for us as a country moving out of this election cycle and moving forward? I think you're a mature enough outfit to be able to handle that. All right, great. But, but, but we'll, we'll keep an eye on you. <laughs> <laughs> well, let us, let us uh, thank uh, General Dallaire.